All right, welcome back to The Devil in Detail, the Grendel Reread Podcast. I'm Eli. And I'm Ben. I think it's our 65th episode. We have a special guest. I think 64. 64. Okay. Yeah, that's all right. Close enough. Yeah, we're close. <laughs> and uh, we do. We have an amazing special guest with us today. So without further, any further ado, we have Miss Diana Schutz. Welcome, Diana. Hi. Hi, guys. How's it going? So good to have you here. Welcome. Welcome. Well, Thanks for inviting me back. Absolutely. Um, just another of the many um, stop backs that I hope you'll do. Thank you. Um, I, you know, I was thinking the other day when I was rereading this particular Grendel, which I know we're going to talk about, but it seems to me right now that I come on this show when you guys want to talk about the grisliest Grendels <laughs> yes. that there yeah. are. <laughs> Well, the, the, this Brian Lee Sung arc has a special place for you. Is that it's like one of your favorites? Is that is that it, the case? Yeah, oh, it, yeah, it is. It is one of my favorites, and I was I was really struck with it when um, you know when it first crossed my desk. And plus, I'm a huge Bernie Miro fan, so I've been following his work since Mackenzie Queen, which was the first comic he ever published way back in the 80s sometime so yeah, yeah. plus yeah, he's a fellow one. fellow montrealer so that's right yeah. uh were they all living was matt living in montreal at that time or when they were creating it because weren't they living together at um, some point as well no but they might have had a studio together ah, okay. um matt matt moved to montreal um to move in with my sis and they they were there for about a year and i don't remember if this had started just before that or if it started during that but yeah interesting it's so funny Same. getting this straight poop because our frame of reference is mage on all your lives and sort of you know that's where <laughs> that's where it starts it goes, oh this is kind of where it you know zigs and zags from reality well yeah and uh, i mean yeah mage is of course allegorical and not the real not not real life you're not a witch real life. you don't have spells and stuff? <laughs> <laughs> no but cats yes. yes yes we just got two brand new black cats wow oh it's, they're absolutely beautiful how many does that make you still have raja no uh no he actually passed away recently oh. yeah it was oh. very tough yeah. yeah so we had to replace not replace sorry we had to you know, kind of take a moment to breathe and then sure. got some new little boys. Yeah. Which has been amazing. Yeah. yeah. But, um, there are, they're kittens. They're kittens. Yeah. Five months old now. The best. That means you don't sleep for a year, just like you, Ben. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it has been very like baby like. I feel like it's like a training, you know? You got to, you got to close, keep the door closed. You got to go in shifts. Like you don't go, you can't go in the room now. They're sleeping. Like leave it. You know, but. And that at night, they like to play they have we have been like trying oh. to like wear them out for like the last mm -hmm. two hours it's like play, yeah. play 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 you know and, uh, that's not sure yeah <laughs> <laughs> oh man um, one of the things but... <laughs> that's that strikes me about yeah. the bernie arc the devil inside is that um it's so much shorter than devil's legacy mm -hmm. and um the, i wonder if you can talk about that and like the pace of the arcs as the series went on well, I mean, that was, that was, of course, really all Matt. But um, in retrospect, I think, you know, Christine was a full year. And I think, mm. I think it was important to have a bit of a, a breather at that point, maybe. Um, you know, not to jump into another really long storyline. And plus, of course, Brian had come out of the, out of the Christine storyline. And I... I don't think I don't think he was that interesting of a character to begin with that he that he could have commanded, you know, like a, another 12 issues. I think it, three issues was just about right for him, you know. Um, yeah. And yeah. the look of it and and the way it immerses you in like his madness, mm. the, the way it, with all the like we had been calling them Bernieisms, the little skulls and the little like you know, like things that you would see in the jam, the little spirals, the black gutters and all that stuff. It's really like Bernie really had a, a way. So did, okay, so Matt brought Bernie into the mix or had you? Yes, 
Okay, Matt, okay. Matt brought Bernie into the mix. So I, I certainly knew, knew his work and loved right. his work. Um, and, uh, and the fans really hated it at first. Um, but then it, it grew on them. And, and for me, I mean, the Panders had evoked a similarly extreme reaction at first. And because their style was so unusual for everything else that was going on at the time that was being published at the time. Um, and, but, you know, people got really used to that kind of glossy, angular, sort of futuristic look that the Panders brought to Grendel. And so the shift from the Panders to Bernie was another extreme kind of change, you know, and at right. first it, it just didn't go down at all. People were expecting, you know, something like the Panders, I guess. And, uh, and that, was, that was one thing that Matt sort of consistently tried to do with the series and, and, and that I thought worked really well, that that there was sort of, um, oh, yeah. you know, dramatic visual change from from story arc to story arc, and not really stuff that the readers would expect. Um, and and again, you, you know, when 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 a story visual or or the writing, when either provokes that kind of extreme reaction then you know something's happening it doesn't matter if if the if the extreme reaction is is negative at first um or even if it's negative the whole way through uh it's really it's it's the other side of the love hate coin you know and if people are that turned off or that it, it's just the other side of being turned on you know in other words they're really vested in it either way so um but as i say with bernie it was it was a pretty quick turnaround for a lot of fans they were kind of shocked at first and then very quickly uh as you say we're we're drawn right into the into the story and the feel of it the visual feel of it oh yeah yeah. Well, how did it work too with you as the um, editor at that point in time? They would send you the pages, or like, and were they, you know, in their studio, and you were at like Dark Horse, or sorry, at Kamiko headquarters, kind of thing, and they like sent you pages. Kamiko headquarters was the, a the fortified run, compound, <laughs> run down, horrible old house, um, wow. in in Norristown, Pennsylvania, which was a horrible little town about twenty miles. Uh, outside of Philly, and the house was falling apart. I mean, it was it was you know it was breaking down. It was owned by the older brother Dennis Lasorda, who had a physical therapy practice on the on the main floor, wow. and and the upstairs was Kamiko, and it, I mean it was you know sort of it was a, a a row house, and so the upstairs of a of a row house and an old row house and it was um yeah that that those were our headquarters so <laughs> that's crazy the whole time it was there it never yeah. like wow yeah that's yeah wild. um so yeah so matt was sending me scripts and how would he have been sending me scripts we didn't have email in those days uh he must have been fedexing them i guess from yeah. montreal photocopies of like typewriter or something mm -hmm. okay yeah Interesting. He might have he might have had a, an early word processor at that point. Um, yeah, Max, we had a Mac in that office. So though I I never touched it, I was still on an electric typewriter in those days. But um, yeah, anyway, um, I, I was getting something from that, and it might have been one of those horrible like dot matrix printout things anyway oh, really? but, like the green oh, and white like strip thing um, with the... no but but you know how the oh, yeah. when the letters are are kind of dotted oh, yeah. in the early days of computer anyway for sure, for sure. um so so yeah i i i must have been getting the scripts via fedex um and then i would edit and then get on the phone with matt and we'd go through any changes that I thought should happen. 
those were usually marathon conversations. And then, uh, and then Bernie would draw, and they must have all been done Marvel style because that's how Matt works. I, you know, I can't, I, I no longer have all the files from those days, which is too bad. I mean, I, when we left Kamiko, I, I junked everything. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it, yeah. Um, yeah, it had, it just, it had to be done plot style because that's what Matt does. So, right. so I must've gotten plot or Bernie got plot. We both got plot. Um, I didn't, I'm, I, I wouldn't have actually like, you know, gone in to copy edit, to line edit until I had an actual script. And those would have uh, then resulted in the marathon conversations with Matt that, that we used to have. But everything was edited before it went to Bob Pinaha for lettering. And man, there was a lot of lettering in that particular series. Right. Right? Yeah, there was. Did this, Bernie do any of the like, the like under the like devil yes, he, he, did, he did he did all of that okay, yeah okay. and it was on a in those days it was on an overlay it wasn't on the same oh, sheet of yeah, paper yeah. It, yeah 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 nice oh that's so cool it must you, be you, ahead, doing Sorry. uh doing marvel method plot script for the panders where you know it's dialogue and captions must be much different for bob and you and matt when there's notebooks and torn notebooks and Bernie has to use overlay. <laughs> like there's so many different lettering approaches. Right. And when we were thinking about it, we were like, well, we know Matt likes plot script, but this is really complicated. So mm -hmm. it's just like, oh, we'll place hold the notebook's gonna go here and whatever it says, we'll treat it X when we get there. Mm -hmm. And right. yeah, and that's 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 certainly how it was done. Um, and And if I'm recalling correctly, yeah, exactly as you say, Ben. Bernie drew in the notepad pages into the art. Um, and then, so those would go to Bob to letter, and he would have to letter directly, oh, you know, handwrite directly yeah. on that. Yeah. It was yeah. This was like a, a trial run for um, Batman Grendel. Was it, was it the same team and in, in the same kind of process, do you think? Um, no, Matt did Batman Crandall. Uh, for the lettering, I meant. It, oh, yeah. I, well, Bob Pinaha was, I mean, God, I was thinking about this too while, while rereading The Devil Inside. Bob Pinaha did damn near everything for us at yeah. Kamiko. I mean, he, he was a tremendous workhorse. He just, and all the lettering corrections he did, you know, I would send the pages back to him every now and then. I remember he would he would drive from New Jersey uh, into the Norristown office uh, of of Kimiko and and do lettering and art corrections on the spot. There, he was. We couldn't. We could never have pulled off what we pulled off without him. He was really. He was a huge help. Um, I, I, I don't remember why Steve Haney lettered the Pander Brothers stuff, but I'm pretty sure it was Bob after, once he took over with Bernie's run, I think he, he went right through to the end. It does uh, seem like. To the Kamiko, yeah. It does seem like once Devlin's side begins that it, the tone, not only the pacing of the arcs, for quite some time changes, but the aesthetic tone and the lettering, it feels like things have really clicked into place. Um, yeah, I'm not sure, you know, when, when, uh, when we were doing Devil's Legacy, and again, you'd, you'd have to check this with Matt, but I, I'm not sure Matt had much thought beyond the Panda Brothers run at that point, um, but then, you know, obviously, somewhere in there, he he got the idea to continue with Brian's story, and and then from there, we were already planning 
other Grendels down the line, including his own. Um, there were four issues in there that Matt wrote and drew himself. Um, but uh, yeah, it was mentioned that yeah that Bernie said something like, um, "What if you know it wasn't a person? That what if Grendel became like a group or like took over a group or something like that? Mm -hmm. And that's what helped to move it on to mm -hmm. being like the drug and the corporation and all that stuff." You know, you guys are much more schooled about Grendel than I am. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we, you know, it's, it's a certain type of schooling that we're getting, like, it's even different from when I read it all through the first time, you know, mm -hmm. because at this point we're reading it issue by issue and drilling down in for like an hour and a half, like getting every little thing. So it's, we're all, we're finding something totally new out of it doing this too, which is great. Um you you guys are the experts you can tell me things <laughs> <laughs> well because we we just went through the kamiko black book too last week and so then we kind of got that little thing and I, I think that's where they mentioned that bernie had said like what if it uh -huh. takes over the group or something like that i haven't looked at that thing in 30 years it's pretty fun and yeah. remember when you know i met you at san diego i got you to autograph the cover which i think is cool i'll try to get it'd be fun to get the whole you know kamiko team on there or something but it's um it, it's a fun like history lesson as well as clearly like a catalog like like I guess sales mm -hmm. tool but um and you know in those days um there was no page design software so everything we were dealing with local Norristown typesetters and 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 so of course what that meant is they would like there was no easy transition. Here's my edited manuscript and you just slide it into your computer and it spits out the correct type. No, this was all set by hand every letter. So I would, you know, for the, for the black book and for the letters columns, I would give them, I would run to the typesetter and I would give them uh, say a letters column, which I had typed out, and then they would have to, again, do that letter by letter, and those tiny, tiny, because it, you know, was a, a tiny point size for the letters column, yeah. um, and so letter by letter, they would have to set that, um, and then it, it would come back to me for proofreading, because it, it wasn't a flow, so it, it was basically a brand new document for me to proofread right so yeah di different times different production yeah, we're so lucky <laughs> that we can just do a pdf and ship it off and then they ship it right to us it's insane. so it's it's a lot easier in a lot of ways yeah yeah so. i wanted to ask you this is changing gears a little bit but about um night and the enemy and harlan ellison and hmm. uh, working with ken stacy um it's pronounced stacy stacy sorry stacey. Oh, no, thank you yeah. Oof, yeah. of course it is <laughs> <laughs> dang um, i gotta edit many that, episodes <laughs> was that was that adapted specifically from from specific um kyber earth war stories or was it a new story I, it's I advertised think, a lot which and we've been talking about it a lot so i th i think i think one of them there were a collection of stories in there maybe three or four. Anyway, I, I think one of them was a new story um, and uh, written specifically for that publication. And yeah, the rest were adaptations of stuff Harlan had already written, which I guess I hadn't read, though I had sure read an awful lot of Harlan's stuff yeah. by that point. But um, yeah. That sounds, yeah, I'm asking the questions. I'm in the same place. I've read stuff, but not those. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Very cool. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, we noted, um, you know, you said that Brian wasn't really, you know, he's, he wasn't really developed that much to, you know, sustain 12 issues, but for three, we saw it and we see this change come over him and that's what the, the story is about. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's through Bernie's lens and Bernie seemingly brings out different things in Matt. We saw that with um, uh, what's it, Ginny, the 
the friend, the other Times right. journalist. Right. Yeah. Um, She's a that's a that's a huge change, right? From the Panders to, to Bernie's right. interpretation of her. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Um, and then with Wiggins also, he gets, you know, he really changes a lot. And then the next four issues, the incubation issues are, which I've never read, are gonna be so Eli tells me they're from his POV as a writer reflecting mm -hmm. on Hunter and mm -hmm. stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah, and an old guy with a paunch too. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's it's cool that there's the the you know like a throwaway line where he's like, "I want to be on the beach drinking margaritas," you know, and right. then we come into the incubation and, then, and it opens yeah. right up. Matt Matt picks picks that right up. Yeah, he's got a floating yeah. coaster with a drink on. I love that man. Yeah, I love that spread so much. And the and the 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 cigarette with the you know like a so like a like a dope pipe with the with the glass bubble in the in the middle of it right mm -hmm. and, and, and a super yeah. long straw that kind of goes right. like down <laughs> so he doesn't have to move and it just hovers around spoilers oh my god <laughs> <laughs> what do you uh diana what do you think it is about writers and grendel the characters sort of taking on writers and needing to journal and it doesn't seem like brian was a writer before or wiggins was before and suddenly when this world touches them it's it's very important for them to get into that that practice i think that's Actually. matt i mean because matt is a writer an author um and uh you know it it's a form he's comfortable with clearly and so it seems natural. I mean, how many how many comics do we read that are narrated by the characters, right? right. And that's 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 another form of them writing in a sense. Um, it's just not made visible in the way that it was, say, with the devil inside with the notepads. But it's still kind of the characters writing the story, that just seems to be sort of a, a natural uh, response of a writer to, to telling a story that, that they'll tell it in the voice of the character. Um, <clears throat> and it was, you know, it was a way to, it was a different visual motif as well, um, to have the notepad and to have Brian sort of keeping a journal and it, and it extends, of course, the theme of Devil by the Deed of the very first Grendel where Hunter writes his journals and, and then that continues. Um, so, yeah, I mean, in terms of the story world, you could say that Grendel is a writer, I suppose, and, uh, and feels the need to express uh, himself or herself, as the case may be, in some form. Um, but but again, I think it's also just that writers are are comfortable making their characters writers of a sort. You know? It's a it's an interesting way to frame it too. Versus like um uh, like maybe you know some people say like the Watcher is all the like little square boxes in Marvel comics, you know, where it's like someone kind of like looking down and, and reacting to it. Whereas if you set it up, like the character is narrating their life. They're not, they're not speaking to you, the reader, they're speaking to themselves. Mm. And then, so then that's an interesting right. different way to frame it. Yes. Yep. Whereas sure. like, Good you know, point. say if it's Lois Lane narrating something as if it's a story for the daily planet, mm -hmm. that's another, that's even a different mm -hmm. way to frame it. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. It, it, a way to for the character to reflect upon itself, and then we're just there kind of for the ride, which is yeah. awesome. Always cool. And the, I mean, for me, the the interesting thing about the about Brian writing his story in in the way that that it's told um, it are the two voices, of course, his own voice in the notepad, and then. The devil's voice that we that we see scrawled at the bottom, mostly at the bottom of each page. Um, Did you and, read that as Tom Waits in your head too, or was that just? <laughs> <laughs> um, 
I don't think I even knew who Tom Waits was back in 1987. So, um, but anyway, no, that, that's that's you, Eli. <laughs> okay. Uh, though it could have been Matt too. I don't know. Could have been. Yeah. Could have been Matt and Bernie. Um, yeah, but the having the devil's voice, so to speak, come right out there on the page like that—that that was ballsy, I thought. And and sort of the nice, a nice way to show how how Brian was was falling apart, you know, after Christine's death, um, being taken over. Was he being taken over, or was he just, you know, racked with grief? And anyway, it, it was a nice way of raising all those questions. And visually, I, it was outstanding, I thought. And especially all the little curly cues and drawings that Bernie added to that. That, that was so great. Yeah, outstanding. Another thing that we have noticed too is like all of these got reprinted mostly all the Kamiko Grendel got reprinted mm -hmm. from Dark Horse. And Matt was telling us a little bit that there was like some trouble kind of digitizing or republishing this one because you didn't have the original art. Correct. Or, okay. Yeah. Um, so we had to scan it. I mean, I don't know if you can, I don't know if you'll be able to see this, but um, so here's, here's the original You can see these pages here, and they all they all have a slight red tint to the black. Yeah, and then uh, and that has to do with the with the scanning procedure at the time um, with the with the hand cut separations. Um, there was there was no way. I mean, it was really hard to. It was a lot harder in those days to get correct color. And so when, when Dark Horse republished, I was really adamant about trying to get the black on the pages, get the black back on the pages. And we succeeded with the first, see this, this red at the bottom tended to bleed into the black on press. Um, so we were able with the first and the third issues to, to get that black, but with the second issue, the red fed into the black again. And I, and I, don't, I don't know why that, I don't know why that is a printing, some kind of printing problem. Mm, interesting. So, yeah. Um, uh, but yes, we did not have the original art. And so we had to scan, we had to scan, the, the Kamiko Grendel. And the Kamiko Grendel is on shitty paper. It's not quite newsprint, but it's only a grade above newsprint. So there's a, a bit of a yellow already to the paper. Um, I don't know if you can. Is that a special edition hardcover that you have that is like the comics? Uh, it's, 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 it's a custom bound. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, there's a, there's a guy in Vancouver, British Columbia who, who does that though. I haven't used him for a number of years now. I don't know if he's still, he's a comics fan and a book binder. So he, that's amazing. He, uh, yeah. I want to do um, that. Yeah. And, it, and it was pretty inexpensive. I have like two shelves of bound books like that. Right. Um, uh, and all, all the Kamiko Grendels are that way. Um, oh, sweet. So anyway, yeah, um, the, the Kamiko publishing was on lousy paper. Um, and then Dark Horse's republishing was on a much better, a whiter grade of paper. So it, it held the color better. But when you're scanning from those originals on that were printed on shitty paper. And that's all that we had to scan from. Um, and remember this was, we were in early days of, of going from, um, yeah, of going into a digital printing environment. This was 2001, 2000, 2001, that we did the, the Bernie series at Dark Horse. And 
um, <laughs> printers were just beginning to print from digital files. They were still half and half. They were still printing from film negatives and just beginning to print from digital. And we were just beginning to take all the scanning in-house um, and to, you know, to do our own scans. And in this case, to scan from my old comics. Um, so, so we could only, we could only get what was there to begin with, you know, and then otherwise we had to go into the scans themselves and, and, and make digital fixes. And we were all sort of at the beginning of doing that sort of stuff. I had done it previously on 300 um, and then had started on Grendel with the, with the Pander run because we couldn't get all the original art there too, though we got quite a bit more of it. Um, and so, I mean, I was just learning how to read those digital scans and just learning how much we could do, how much we could fix, how much we couldn't fix. Um, so, you know, it's conceivable that if we were to redo it all today, it could be that much better. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we did what we could with the available technology then, so. I wonder what happened to the original art? Was it, sorry, Ben. Uh, no, no idea. Just, yeah, collectors or? Gone. Gone. Yeah, I mean, it, it would have, you know, would have all gone back to Bernie. Right. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't know if he sold it or, or what, so, yeah. The big change that we noted in Dark Horse was there were scenes that went from cool palettes to warm ones. Mm -hmm. um, was that because when you can, can you talk about that? Do you recall those? Um, I don't actually, though I just reread all this. Um, again, I think with the second issue, the red, you know, that red. that red, which is a combination of of yellow and and uh, magenta um, fed into fed into the black so that gave the blacks the yellow wound up giving the blacks more of a warmer tone mm -hmm. overall but in the first and the third issues it it didn't although you can see I mean on every single page the dominant color of that page feeds into the blacks and that's that's just something that happens on press um, and it it depends the way the pages are configured on the presses too, because, you know, we we were printing then, uh, then and then at Kamiko and at Dark Horse um, on a web press, and those the presses were set up to run sixteen pages at once. So, for a thirty-two page comic, you would have two. Uh, flats is what they're called and 16 different pages are set up on those flats and they print out as one big giant sheet and then when you fold it over then you have your pages in order wow. so when you have those 16 pages printing on the one giant sheet the colors can influence, you know, like the colors on page four can influence the color on page 17 kind of thing. It's, mm. you know, it, it, the pages are, are all configured according to how they, how they need to be folded in order to come out in order. And so we, I mean, we had the same problem with 300 where some pages were largely blue and other pages were largely red and they would be on the same flat and so you were trying to keep the red out of the blue pages and the blue out of the red pages and it's uh, it's tough with 300 um, that project was a, such an important one that we actually had uh, our our print print buyer um, on press in China uh, when it was, when the first edition, first printing was rolling off the press. Um, with the floppies, I, I don't think anybody was on press. So it was kind of up to the whim of 
of the printer at that point. Were um, on three hundred were those boards delivered on single pieces of illustration board or? Yes. Um, yeah. Well, every every two pages, every right. thread me. was was one single illustration, and Frank had just started working twice up at that point in time. So they were gigantic. I mean, <laughs> cause you know, one spread itself would be gigantic enough at, at, at uh, one and a half times up, which is the usual uh, size up that artists work in, in professional comics. But, um, Frank was working old style the way the way the guys used to do in the 40s at twice twice the size of a reproduction so and then with the spreads of course they were really I mean <laughs> I used to get them and he, he would go buy um, big art portfolios and he'd put the pages into the art portfolios and then tape up the art portfolios and ship those. FedEx certainly didn't have any boxes that would accommodate that size. So, yeah. Yeah. You've really worked on some of the best comic book projects that have ever existed. Well, I, I've, so, been you know. I've been lucky. I've just uh -huh. been lucky. Yeah. yeah. One of the things that uh, seems to be repeated uh, a number of times in letter pages and interviews and all this is, a, a real focus on uh, with Grendel to push the medium forward. Um, and it seems like in the seventies and, and eighties, that was, there was a big focus on that, that people were, whether it was distribution or creator rights or just being free of editorial or doing adult content. Um, and that, uh, could you talk about that a little bit? And, not like why that's important, but how what role that played in the mindsets and how that fomented. Um, actually, I'm really glad that you bring that up because I think nowadays people have forgotten. You know, I mean, it's not to not to uh, raise a big thorny political issue, but you know, it's like the news I read today about Texas and abortion. It, it seems like people have just forgotten how hard we worked to get Roe v. Wade to pass. And, and they've, it was so long ago um, that people, yeah, don't know or have forgotten that it was a huge battle. And I, I see the same thing with, with comics now. Um, we fought such a hard battle in the late 70s and throughout the 80s for creators to get their rights um, that people now seem to take it for granted, you know? Um, and I think that's dangerous. Uh, I think Texas shows us why that's dangerous. Um, first of all, editors had a, a huge bad rap in the 60s and 70s and, and, and into the 80s and deservedly so. Um, remember that in those days we had Marvel in DC and that was about it. And the publisher owned everything. And in those days, and even still to some extent now, um, if you wanted to work in comics, you, you were forced to sign a work for hire contract. You owned nothing. You could not there, there simply were no other options. You had to sign away all your rights. So, um, and editors were tyrants a lot of the time. Uh, not Archie Goodwin, God bless him, but um, you know, guys like my my favorite editor of the '60s, Mort Weisinger. The stories about him are are horrifying. Um, the way he treated his writers and artists and, uh, you know, as if they were sort of peons who could be replaced at a moment's notice. Um, they were poorly paid. And, uh, and again, the editors were in control. They prevented their creators from talking to each other because 
that was a way for editors to maintain control. Um, so coming in as an editor in the 80s was not, you know, <laughs> it wasn't really a, a good place to be. Um, a lot of people, Dave Sim, self-publishing, a huge reason to self-publish was because they distrusted editors. They didn't want anyone having any control over their work. Um, and so it was, I mean, it was a huge political battle to fight for creators' rights in those years. And every single one of the independent companies, at least in those early years, were founded on the basis of giving creators the rights that they had been struggling for. Um, so, so, and I mean, this is why Matt began with a little company like Kamiko and, you know, wasn't uh, bombarding DC or Marvel with his, with his art samples. Mm -hmm. um, he wanted to do his own work and he wanted to do it the way he wanted to do it and he wanted to own it. And so all those things were really important. And, and when I came into comics, those were all the values that I espoused at the same time um, to the point that, yeah, I, could, I mean, you guys know I, I didn't last very long at Marvel. Um, I, I left within a week and I, I didn't really, I just, I didn't understand the attitudes there. Again, with the exception of Archie Goodwin, it just, it, it really wasn't for me, that kind of shitty treatment of the creators. Um, and then when Shrek and I left Kaneko, and within a year, right at the same time, we were both offered jobs in two different places. We were both offered jobs at DC in New York and at Dark Horse in Portland. And, um, and DC was paying a shitload more money. Dark Horse was 10 people at that time. There was, you know, and not one of those 10 people had ever worked for a publishing company. Um, and yeah, DC wanted to give us a lot more money, but Dark Horse, again, Dark Horse, you know, Dark Horse was publishing creators who own their own work. And so that was, that was a major factor in our decision to go there. Um, Is that why you then moved and created Maverick or started the Maverick line too over at Dark Horse? Was kind of like an extension of that? Um, to, some, to some extent, yes. I mean, because Dark Horse had uh, in the 90s, Dark Horse had begun doing licensed projects. Um, and, you know, there are some good reasons to do that. Uh, most of them at the beginning were just real fanboy projects for Mike Richardson, you know, the, the, the owner and founder of Dark Horse. Um, aliens and Aliens versus Predator was an idea they came up with one night in the bar, Mike Richardson, Randy Stradley, and Chris Warner. And, you know, I Amazing. mean, they, they were just throwing around ideas. What would they like to do with their favorite movie characters? And so, so those licenses were, were, were fueled by, by love of the stories and characters and wanting to be able to create their own stories about those 20th Century Fox characters. Um, but later, it, you know, by the middle 90s, I would say that yeah, it, it, well, it wasn't that anymore. It was a money grab, you know? And so, um, and Dark Horse was, was getting to be known as that licensed company. And, and it was really important to me to remind people that no, Dark Horse had started as a company founded on creator friendliness and that largely we were still publishing 
lots of creator owned books, but they were just sort of getting lost in the shuffle of all these licensed books. Um, so that's, that's partly why I created the Maverick line. Uh, also, to, to hold on to Frank Miller, because he had, it, we were sending, Dark Horse was sending Frank every single comic that, that we ever published. Um, there were a few people on that sort of special list, you know, comps, comps of everything go to these people. Frank was one of them. And he called me one day and said, you know, I just got the recent, the most recent batch of Dark Horse comics. And there's like Aliens, this and Terminator, that and blah, 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 Star Wars here and and then he said, and Sin City, and Sin City doesn't fit, doesn't fit with the rest of what you guys are publishing. And I don't, you know, I don't, I don't like the idea of, of keeping my work there. Mm, so, interesting. Uh, so I came up with this idea to create an imprint that would sort of spotlight the fact that, no, no, we still had lots of creator <laughs> books. And, and, so, and so that was Maverick. Um, it was Frank actually who came up with the name. And, um, but he, unfortunately, like every other imprint that Dark Horse ever published, uh, it, got, it really got no support. It got no marketing. It got a slight marketing push at first and then, you know, and then people were on to the next bright, shiny object. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, it eventually just sort of fell apart. But yes, it was, yeah. it, it was definitely uh, a, a push to, to remind our audience, our readership that we were publishing lots of creator own books. It's really interesting in Dark Horse at that period, because like a lot of people don't think about it too, but the mask movie came out right around there which is a creator owned book from dark horse mm -hmm. were you there at that time and did that change the way everything worked there did that give them the money to get these licenses um well the movie money saved that company a lot of times the first one actually was 1992 i think and it was a horrible movie called dr giggles which oh, yeah. which mike shot right here in Portland, uh, one of the first Portland made productions. And it was Mike's first uh, Dark Horse Entertainment production. Um, so, and even though it was terrible, it made him a ton of money and he shoveled all that money right back into the comic company. So, um, and then ditto with the mask. Um, but Which, I mean, yeah. that's a whole nother level. Jim Carrey was like the biggest actor but it, at the time. It was, it was only Mike's second movie. Yeah. You know, it was Dark Horse Entertainment's second movie. And yeah, it, it was a whole other level um, because Jim Carrey was relatively new and he did such an amazing job. And they were, you know, they were mimicking the old Tex Avery cartoon look. Right. Um, and yeah, so th that was good. It was funny. It worked. And yeah, it made a ton of money. And, uh, and in the mid 90s, when Marvel fucked up by leaving Diamond to go to that little New Jersey based Heroes World horrible family distributor that couldn't handle national distribution at all. So that that put Diamond kind of on the skids. And, you know, at that point, there were like 17 distributors in the country or more. And um, that put Diamond on the skids. And that led to Diamond and Capital uh, uh, sort of shooting it out, as it were. And Capital went down. Um, DC Comics went exclusively with Diamond. Dark Horse and Image decided to do the same. Um, so Capital City distribution went down. And at that point, Diamond pretty much became the only distributor 
with the exception of Heroes World distributing Marvel's comics and doing such a horrible job of it that, you know, within a year or two, the owners of Heroes World were in jail and Marvel had to go back to Diamond. Uh, but by then, Diamond had a monopoly. But it that all of that stuff at the distributor level wound up um, financially hurting a lot of companies. But Dark Horse had the mask money right, right around that wow. same time. So we were, I mean, I remember we had one Black Friday where where I don't know, one third, one third of the staff was let go. Um, but without the mask money, the company could have gone, you know. So wow. that's one thing about Mike and and as much as as much as people gave him grief for, you know, spending his time in Hollywood, uh, which he really didn't spend that much time in Hollywood. He was in the Portland office, you know, three or four days a week. So, um, but it, all that movie money kept going back into the comics company, so. But we were uh, both 11 at the time. We probably saw the movie six times to between the two of us. Oh I know God, I saw it three times in the theater. I was such oh, a big Jim Carrey fan. Jesus. Um, Blew my mind. With, uh, we know that you're, uh, we, we thank you for your time, Diana. We want to uh, respect you. With um, all the uh, innovation and uh, medium, pushing the medium forward stuff, were there ideas with Grendel that were just too weird? Like, what, like were there any, any ideas that were just batted around that tried to get really extreme? He said, I don't know if we can really do that. Or is I, everything a go? Yeah, I, 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 I think everything was a go. I mean, um, certainly, you know, one of the things about, about having the editorial career that I had was that I, I was surrounded by people who really knew their work. Um, I mean, by, by creators who really knew what they were doing. Um, and they were my best teachers, really. So um, no idea was really too crazy for me not to try to pursue. I, I don't, yeah, I mean, I, I can't think of anything that that I said no to or that I would have said no to because these people were all so much smarter <laughs> than I was. So um, and again, you know, that was that was the whole thing. The we we were in service to the creators, not the creators in service to the publisher. It was a complete right. reversal of the old way of thinking. And um, and I always felt my mandate as an editor was to try to do whatever my creators wanted to get done. So, um, so yeah, I, I, I don't, I don't remember, really don't remember ever saying no, that's, that's too weird. Uh, and you know, when you, when you trust the people that you work with, um, that's just kind of the way it goes, you know? I was wondering about like when stuff was coming out and I know we're, we're about to end here, but um, when stuff was coming out, like, you know, Ben and I weren't really, we weren't there when these were fresh on the newsstands and stuff. It seems like uh, Grendel was Kamiko's best-selling book. Was there critical acclaim? Was there, you know, uh, you know, was there a lot of fanfare about it in, you know, comics journal? Did it feel like, hey, we've got a hit our hit on our hands or anything? Um, yeah, I don't think the comics journal ever gave a rat's ass for <laughs> anything that, that we did. Um, right. But uh, the, the Panda Brothers Grendel was a huge hit at first. In fact, we had to go back to press on issue one. Right. Um, and if I recall the numbers, I think we sold like 70,000 copies of that first issue, which for little Kamiko in Norristown, Pennsylvania, that was 
really unexpected for us. Um, so, uh, and yeah, I mean, there, there had to be reviews. I, am, I, I sort of vaguely remember quoting from stuff in the letters columns, um, it, but certainly by issue 12, it was no longer selling 70,000 copies. You know, that's kind of the first issue always starts high and then it goes down and then it sort of settles at a at some point you know the the, the readers who are committed but um was there a lot of letters that came in and i know we read the, the letters column and sometimes you focus on good and sometimes you focus on bad but you know <laughs> how is that that is the best i was i was re <laughs> i was rereading those letters columns the Kamiko ones yeah. and the dark horse ones and i gotta say i'm a little embarrassed by that but um <laughs> that was really good you know he let me because i had grown up as a i had i had come into comics as a letter hack myself you know um i i started writing letters to comics the summer of 81 and um and, and they started getting published. Um, and in those days, there were not that many women reading comics uh, and fewer of us were writing to the comics. M me and, and a gal named Elizabeth Holden, another Canadian woman. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I, I, had a, I had a personal fondness for the letters columns and, um, so Matt, Matt very kindly let me run rampant with them, maybe a little too rampant. But... <laughs> oh, your own, uh, your own Grendel kind of comes out sometimes. <laughs> that's the best part. <laughs> uh, that's awesome. All right, so I guess we can round it out here, but while we're doing so, can you tell us a little bit about some of the translation work and the stuff that you're doing right now and where we can pick it up? Um, I just... We just, my partner Brandon and I just uh, finished the most recent Black Sad translation. Um, that's a book written by Juan Diaz Canales and drawn by Juanjo Guarnido. And it's an interesting situation because the writer is Spanish. So the scripts, the original scripts are in Spanish, but the primary publisher and the rights holder is Dargo in Paris. So the official mm -hmm. text for translation is the French translation of the original Spanish. Wow. So in a perfect world, you want a translator who can handle both languages, um, which is where I come in. Brandon, Brandon uh, uh, speaks French. We both grew up in Montreal, of course. So. Um, so he did the preliminary translation from the French. And then I went in this last month of 12 hour days every day. I, I went in and, and sort of redid the translation um, based on both the French and, and the Spanish. When the French translation went too far away from the original Spanish, um, I would often check with, with writer and artist to see which version they preferred. Um, so, and I'm the one, Brandon is not really used to fiction. So I'm the one who tries to give each character their own particular voice. All of that, um, all that stuff is, is a function of the, of the target language, the language that you translate into, uh, not the language that it comes from voice and tone and all, all of that has to do with the, the language that's spoken. So it all has to be added in when you're translating it. it mm. It's, it's, yeah. So anyway, um, so we just, just finished that. Um, and I'm, I'm particularly happy about that because Black Sad hasn't been published for seven years. The artist has been off doing a bunch of other crazy stuff. Um, and I had edited Black Sad at Dark Horse 
and uh, and they asked me to come back to freelance edit this book too, uh, which is um, Black Sad, They All Fall Down is the title. And so um, the French version, the French edition comes out in October and the English edition will come out just before San Diego. And I hope like hell, we can all go to San Diego next summer, that yes. there is a San Diego and that we can go and not have to wear masks all day. And, you know, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes, let's hope. So, yeah. Thank you so much for your time, Diana. That was, yes. that was fantastic. Well, thanks for having me, you guys. Thanks Absolutely. for continuing your, your in-depth look at Grendel. We, we all appreciate it. Of course. Thanks we, for uh, keep on Grendeling over here, as we say. <laughs> Thank you so much, Diana. See you yeah. later. See ya. Bye. All right, Diana, thank you so much. So great to have her. Um, real quick shout outs at the end here. I want to shout out all the people who um, hit me up and sent me their addresses for the Grendel zine that is oh so close to coming out. Thank you to Andrew Kahak, Kahak, um, uh, Jeffrey Saito, Brock Collins. Uh, yeah, so I just have those three addresses right now. So hit me up. Oh, no, sorry, Neil Camber. And Barry Tan. Oh, Barry Tan did the art. All right. So yeah, hit me up with your addresses. Get us that five-star review and then email me at Cosmic Lion, Eli at CosmicLionProductions.com. And that ween zine is about to go out very soon. And yes, we did have some international people hit me up. Uh, just pay the shipping and I'll, I'll ship it out to you. Just pay the shipping. It's that easy. Just pay the shipping. Ain't no thing but a chicken wang. All right. An amazing interview with Diana. And next week, we'll be back. We'll be back. You got to plug our cane first. We got. We got. We got to plug our cane first. Our new. Our uh, new book yeah, is available yeah. finally. You can count the places where we stole from Matt. Here's. Uh, here's one up here. There's another over there. <laughs> Better call him an issue too. Is a whole other thing. Yeah. Matt. Uh, available from CosmicLionProductions.com yeah. or perhaps your local comic shop. It came out great. We're so thrilled. It really did. Yeah, it really, really, really did. Really did. And uh, the second issue is going to go to print within weeks from now. It's yeah. unbelievable. We're hoping to have a monthly book. And also, um, Diana's autobiographics actually just got reprinted. And you can pick oh, that cool. up from Dark Horse. This is the original print, but there's a new print. Features Sergio Aragonese, Gabriel Ba, Eddie Campbell, Paul Chadwick, Farrell Dalrymple, Will Eisner, Frank Miller, Bill Morrison, Arnold Pander, Diana Schutz wrote a story here, Stan Sakai, William Stout, and Matthew Wagner. His famous chicken parm recipe comic is in there it's amazing the lady killing chicken parm terrific all right y'all vivat grendel and keep on grendeling later on